the skin is now pretty much done. Um, not colored, but sculpted. And now I think I'm going to move on to painting the, the armor. And then once that's painted, I will assemble it, you know, do the final sticking it into place. At that point, I will then paint the skin because that way I can, can integrate the armor and the skin, I think. Um, and I'll probably have to do a few little skin touch-ups here and there where the, where the pieces connect and, um, yeah, so making good progress, which I need to be because today is Saturday night and the show is Thursday, so I have to have this done by Wednesday night, so Saturday night, so I have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I have four days, really two days and two evenings. So this is gonna be pretty intense. So let's go, let's talk about painting. Here's the, here's the first thing. Um, you know, I made these casts that didn't, <laughs> that uh, didn't meet my quality bar. So I kept them set aside for painting tests. I always wanna do that. Oh, you never wanna start painting right on your final thing. So I've got some notes here on my thoughts about um, how I'm going to go about the painting or, well, the thoughts first are more like the theory of what this thing is and why I'm going to make the choices that I'm going to make regarding the painting. See, a lot of tutorials, the tutorialist will just be like, here's the thing I'm going to do. Boop, boop, boop. I did it. Not me, with me, you get to sit through a half hour lecture about why I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing and then watch me not quite achieve what it is that I was trying to do in the first place. That's the quality you're paying for. Okay, so stonework. Here's the thing. I've, I've mentioned this several times. This is a magical construct of unknown origin. There is no official lore that says how these things were constructed or or why you get a pretty good idea of why they're they're um basically uh, what, what is that thing from harry potter crux cruxes soul crux crux size huh whatever they are you know um voldemort had his soul split into pieces and put into horcruxes that's what they are so, so these things are like horcruxes, like living horcruxes that hold the soul of Dorman, this, this ancient god of, uh, you don't know if it's good or bad, I don't know. But anyway, he, it's been split up into 16 pieces and put into these different colossi. I think I remember looking it up and it was colossuses. It doesn't matter, it does not matter. Uh, so the point is that these things contain a part of a god's soul. And where did they come from? We don't know. And there are some clues, however, and I would like to lean into those clues as opposed to contradicting those clues. So, clue number one. The armor seems to be, uh, in parts, like, growing out of the creature, or at least uh, so custom fit that it seems, it's not like, it's not like armor that was built for it exactly. Maybe it was, it's hard to say. Specifically in this shoulder joint, you can see it kind of looks like there's a bony thing growing out, like, like these bones, right? But then there's this intricately carved rock over it. And it's hard to tell from the low resolution art if the intention was that the stone were individual pieces like bricks that were put together with mortar or, or you know joined together somehow or if it's like one solid piece of rock that's been carved into these shapes. In my sculpting I was kind of going more with the brickwork idea leaving it somewhat open like I don't have mortar oozing out of the joints or anything like that right so it could still go either way um the biggest kind of uh 
choice point I had to make was these parts on the on the gauntlet that are cracked and broken. So on each of his arms he has this broken thing which I kind of interpreted as handcuffs where he was like chained to a wall or something and he just like broke out. To me that's the story that explains why there's two symmetrical breakages on his two armbands. And here I did this very clear, you know, these are bits of rubble, bits of stone that have, um, that were composed into this piece that are now shattered and broken into their individual pieces again. So that is kind of the direction I'm leaning is the idea of like, uh, he's a giant creature and this stuff has been built on him by unknown entities, either magic or well, people climbed all over him. Maybe they, maybe they hit him with a blow dart and, you know, put him to sleep and then did their work and then left him. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So the point is, um, in painting this, I have to go one way or another. Either it's one big stone that's been carved or it's individual bricks that have been put together. And so this is where, like, I feel like it's six of one and half a dozen of another as far as like what makes sense what would be cool but i'm leaning towards the brickwork interpretation because what makes this guy so cool is that he is a mix of a giant beast and architecture and architecture is not made by carving one massive stone into a gothic cathedral you know what I mean? It's it's brick by brick and you know, so I'm looking at reference of castles and palaces and ruins and all that stuff and so because people have seen these things, castles and ruins, uh, we have certain um, shape language, color language, stuff that's associated with that. If this was all one rock, you would expect it to be all one tone all one kind of like weathered and in a similar way but ruins and castles are awesome looking because of the variegation because there's different tones of rocks you can see some are pitted and scarred and some are more pristine and some have like cool weathering over them so i really want to lean into that i want to do that really cool paint job that makes it look like an old ruined castle not ruined but old so here's another like random lore question that is answered by the decisions that I make regarding the painting. So one of the things that makes castles uh, very unique is that oftentimes there'll be a wall and half of it's collapsed and 200 years later they came and built, rebuilt the wall and they use different rocks or they used, uh, you know, the rubble, but it's, it's changed around or mortared differently or, you know, just different construction techniques. So all of these factors play into to making the composition of old stone buildings very, like, um, well, just varied, very varied. And that's cool. Um, if, if this guy had his armor breaking and falling apart and then repeatedly repaired using stones from different quarries or different construction techniques, he would have that same sort of cobbled together nature. That is something that I think is maybe just, just half a bridge too far as, as far as getting too far away from the source material. Like it, in the game asset, all the armor is very similar tone to each other. It's not like he's got a reddish hewn, uh, hued uh, shoulder over here and a, and a gray green one over here. They're, they're all the same kind of gray green bluish uh, homogenous look. So, so what I'm going to do to kind of grab some of that cobbled flavor without going full force is I'm just going to be doing, like I, like I did with the base, individual tiles, individual stones and bricks. I'll, I'll call out some of them as being, you know, more blue or more yellow or more green. Um, and that'll be that. Um, yeah, so, so that's the 
theory behind it all. That's why I'm going to be making the decisions you're about to be seeing. Um, and the next step is to experiment to see what gets me closest to that. So I wrote down a couple of, here's the steps that I believe I'm going to go through. And there are six of them. So we start with the base coat and that's just, you know, a, a layer of primer and just gray primer. Um, and then part of that base coat, additionally, I'm going to go in and do some stippling and spatter and stuff to give it just some, some age and, and perceived weathering and variegation, modeling, that kind of stuff. Um, if you look at some of these old ruins, you can see kind of what I'm going for. Like they're very homogeneous gray, but the weathering makes part of them really light and part of them really dark. And uh, the, the little lichen splotches everywhere, that like white or black kind of lichen. I definitely want to get that sort of feeling in there. So that's gonna be number one, the base coat. Number two, is color variety and that's where I'm gonna go in and paint individual stones I'm just gonna I don't want to go overboard I don't want it to look like the the floor I think was maybe a little too colorful um, or or more colorful than I want the armor to be so I'll be doing that that's number two number three airbrushed low lights and that's just a matter of taking the airbrush and going into like these little recessed areas and like painting them dark and I'm doing that after the color because I want this to really feel like just built up grime from the eons um, I may do a little bit of weathering like like um, water that's just run down the same course for for millennia and it kind of gets that look I don't want to go very heavy with that because this is a living organic thing, meaning it moves around, presumably, when it's not attacking Wander. And so I, I don't expect it to have, you know, just these very directional streaks. We'll see. I'm going to play with it and we'll see. Um, after that, you do a clear coat. And the reason you do a clear coat is because next, number five, is the wash. And like I did with the rocks, I'm going to do a, some experiments to see what works best with this. I've got several experiments in mind. I did some looking on the, on the internet. And so I'm going to be trying acrylic paint, water, and dish soap. Acrylic paint, water, and denatured alcohol. Um, matte medium. And acrylic ink. So we'll see and, and see what runs into the rivulets and cover, you know. We'll see. We'll see. And then finally, a clear coat and specularity variation. Just like I did with the base. You do a, I'm doing just a matte finish. So it's very dull coated. And then just go in and pick some of the rocks out and make them a little, a little shinier. So yeah, that is what I'm about to do. Sorry for that giant block of talking. And I didn't even cover. Look at, look at this. I could have said all that. I probably said more than that. I should have literally just read this and it would have gone faster. But again, this is, uh, you're getting what you're paying for. And I'm in a huge rush right now. So let's start doing some of our tests. I'm going to go over to the paint booth over here. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to try is uh, just the cheapest acrylic paint. Always use reference, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I am trying to achieve something like this kind of thing going on for right now. I just want that so it's not plain gray. You can see right now it's just gray. So I want it to have some parts of light, some parts of dark. And it's not super important where. There just needs to be some variation going on. Actually, that makes pretty good spatter by itself. So 
So one of the things you can notice in some of these images, like this for example, there's a big darkish area. There's a big whitish area. In here, this is mostly gray. Up here, there's more white than there is down there, right? So I want to reproduce that to some extent. I want to have some areas that are just like way darker than others. Okay. Now I am going to do this little thing where I take some denatured alcohol and I'm just gonna spritz it on here. Hmm. What? This is not um not getting the little dotty pattern I was hoping for yet. That's what experiments are for. All right, oh, need paper towels. See what I was hoping was that as I splash this on, I'd get little, little flecks of um, the black being removed. Although because the stonework pattern is so uh, busy, I guess it's probably would be lost anyway if there was a lot of speckling. We'll see. So the other thing to do rather than subtracting paint that you've put on is adding paint. So let's see what happens when we spatter some white on there. Oh, that is not the kind of spatter I wanted. So different uh, size brushes, different length of hair, stiffness, all those things will play into what kind of a spatter you're going to get. In this case, I just loaded so much in the brush that it just vomited out there. Not the look that I wanted. But it's easy enough to just soften up by patting it around a bit. Yeah, I just, I don't think that's good bristles for what I'm trying to do. Let me get a tooth, toothbrush. It looks like the areas where I got in with the alcohol and did the dabbing is giving me some good, some good variegation. Let me try getting a little more aggressive with that and see what happens. a finger painting method. Hmm. Now it's starting to get some uh, some effects that I like. This is, <clears throat> I think this is probably the closest to the actual texture that the Colossus has. So I'm kind of, I'm going for that the most. And it's mostly this medium gray, you know, like you can see that, that medium gray. It's got a few blocks that are darker here and there. But then a lot of just, <clears throat> a lot of white splotchiness. And I'm getting that just by doing that kind of finger smudging on there and then where it's too strong I just go in with the with this alcohol rag 
and uh, blot it a little bit. When I'm doing this finger smudging, I'm trying not to get a dry, a dry brush look where it's like only hitting the tips. But of course, when you're smudging it with your finger, that's a, that's a big fat smoodger. So it's going to have troubles getting into the cracks. So if I combine a paintbrush with it, that seems to work pretty well. And I'm not too concerned about areas where the white is stuck in the cracks like that because once I do the wash that will that will cancel that out, I'm pretty sure. The, the dark paint will settle into that crack. And even if some of that white still shows, it'll just show as, you know, a lighter dark. It won't show as white. Okay. Now I want to try spattering with the alcohol, see what that does. Oh, nice. So I had this pretty full of white. I put alcohol in it, which makes it a, a really uh, thinned out white. And now when I spatter it, it gets a nice, uh, more subtle um, sp splashes, splatters, whatever these are. One thing I'm hoping I'm able to pull off is both an interesting rock modeling, but also um, the ability to make out all the sculpted detail. It would suck to have spent, you know, 800 hours sculpting all this detail in, and then the paint job just pretty much hides it, right? That would, that would be quite a bummer. So I'm probably going to err on the side of keeping things pretty, pretty plain and leaning on the wash to bring out most of the stone detail. But I still, I still insist that I do need some of this kind of noise in there. All right, so I'd say that's, that's a good um, test number one for a base coat. I'm gonna set this aside and let it dry and do another technique. So now I'm going to do, I guess, let me just try this, the simplest thing, which is just blotching random colors on and see what happens. And on this one, I'm going to purposely leave some, I'm gonna do some much lighter areas and some much darker areas just to see after after I do the, the other steps on it, if that ends up being a better look than the last one I did, which is a little more uniform. So some, I don't have any parts that are going to be pure white, but I'd say I'll bring it up to maybe, you know, 20% gray and then down all the way to maybe 80% gray in other areas. and some really contrasting spots too. I like that. Um, let's see, where's some reference? It's got some good contrasty. So these, my ink was running out sadly, so it doesn't really show, but you can see there's very light right there and very dark right there. So that's definitely a thing that can exist. It's just a question of does it, does it work well for this particular application? Really liking that look right there. I think especially on the on the wider stones like this one where it's not, you know, so so on the super detailed parts, that much noise I think detracts from the sculpted uh, detail. But on big wide open um, areas, 
That looks it looks great. So Let's look at these two here. So this one is pretty homogenous uh, with lots of, of very very detailed little dots. This one is uh, more varied, got very light areas, very dark areas. Um, I'm not sure how far I want to go in really differentiating or that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, making sense of which parts would be dark and which parts would be light. If you look at the reference, it looks like uh, it really, yeah, it's like this is one big kind of samey surface, but here it's really light and here it's really dark. So it looks like it probably has to do a lot with just weathering the way the wind typically blows and where water falls and stuff like that. So, so I think fairly random is fine. We'll see. Alright, what else can we try? Um, well, one thing we can certainly try is having um, just the gray primer, and that's it. We'll just leave it like that and see how that compares. Um, finally, let's, let's try a, like a dry brushing feel if the base of it is dry brushed most of the work that I'm going to do over it is probably going to wipe out most of that dry brushing but you know it may just end up being a better look overall so I'm forcing myself to do this really fast so that I'll have accidental little um, movements that add randomness because I can't trust myself to be as random as I need to be for this. So one thing I'm noticing, I, I put this paint on really wet and now when I'm hitting it with a little bit of paint and a lot of alcohol, um, I'm getting uh, more of the effect that I was hoping at the beginning. So my next test is going to be mostly alcohol based. So I think I'll pretty much, I'll just leave that as is, even though there's areas that look too sloppy to my eye right now, I'm going to go ahead and not trust my instincts. And I'm just going to let it be like that. And then we'll see how that looks after all the other steps are done. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to do a super, super alcoholy. In fact, I'm just going to dump a bunch of alcohol on there right now. Now I'll go in with some black. But since there's so much alcohol in there, it's going on super thin, which is fine. Basically just trying to get a super wet coat on there right now. Okay. Now with that really wet coat, I'm going to take some white and an alcoholy brush. See what that gives me. So because there's so much alcohol on the surface, when the little spots land, they're naturally starting to diffuse. And that is getting the look that I was hoping for at the beginning. 
This way I can get some good light and dark areas, but they're mottled and variegated with, this, with the spatters. Okay, these base coats are dry enough now to go on to the next step, which is the color variety. Um, but first, I'm going to assess the different techniques that I did and how well I think they turned out. Always using reference. Okay, so, I think like I said earlier, this is the piece that is most directly applicable to the Colossus. I'm pulling various uh, thoughts and ideas out of other things, you know, like this has a lot of carvings that are very much like the Colossus. So it's useful to have that reference on hand. Um, and this kind of stuff is neat. So here was test number one. And I think this is a complete disaster. What this looks like to me is this stuff. Now, a lot of novices think that this says stone on it. So if you spray something with it, it will look like stone. Please don't do that, that's not true. It does not look like stone, it looks like this. Uh, this is fine for a base coat as long as you're going to do something else with it. Add to it, scrape it away, use it in little, I, I don't know, just don't think that that actually is stone. So, bad test. I will rebase that one for further other tests if I need to. Uh, let's see, this was the second test where I tried to do some light, some dark, in larger patches. And I think this is good enough, or, or I would say promising enough to take to the next stage. Um, I, I don't love it, I don't hate it. This was the third test where I did just a lot of smudging all over. I put darks into the dark areas. I, I smudged light on the top areas. Um, I think this is kind of in the same category as this, where it's like, meh, let's, let's see what happens when we take it forward. Um, this was test zero, which was just leave the prime, the just plain primer. And so that's kind of our, this is like our sanity check. So if, <laughs> you know, if we, do the next couple steps on this and the next couple steps on this and they turn out looking so similar that I might as well not have wasted my time. That's a valuable thing to know. Okay, um, I think this was the next one I did and I feel like this is the most successful as far as looking like the thing. I mean, it's, it's obviously darker than this. It's closer to a lot of these kind of stones which is fine. As a base coat, I mean, there's gonna be... Hmm. Yeah, actually, I, I'm going to do some dry brushing, but very light. I do not want to... Um, I want to lean mostly on the wash to bring out the details. Dry brushing um, is good at times, and other times it just it looks like dry brushing. And, Maybe I'm just not good enough at it. We'll see. Okay, this was the final test I did where I just went all out. I put all the balls against all the walls. And was like, what happens if there's just super light, like almost white areas? And 
I think that is a real thing that exists. I mean, that, that color tone, you know, like on this wall here, it's pretty close to that. Um, I'm afraid that this is going to be too similar to the skin. Let's look at the skin texture on the Colossus, shall we? Here is the actual texture from the texture sheet. And you can see it looks almost like that, that navy camouflage. You know, it's got super dark, super light, mostly in the middle. Um, let's see if we can find a good example of it in action. I mean, there you can see a big swath on his back, but it has very light and very dark patches. And if the armor also looks like that, I think it's just all gonna kind of blend together into a mess. I want the armor to stand out better than that. It's, uh, I feel like the armor stands out in the, uh, in the actual piece. So, yeah, I don't want to mimic it too much. I feel like the armor is more towards the like, um, greenish, yellowish gray and the skin is more towards the kind of bluish greenish gray. So the armor is kind of warmer in a greeny way. Um, but overall you can see that there is definitely lighter and darker areas, but they're not big splotches like they are on the skin. They are not big splotches like this. So I think this does, mm, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to the next level just because I want to see what happens if I go over it with other colors because it may and, and then after the wash because that may tap down this effect so dramatically that it doesn't end up with the problem I just expressed. So yeah, so pretty much everything is good to go except for that first one, which is just crap. I also have this. I printed out a couple images of just like raw stone in nature. Um, just I wanted to see, you know, that looks like dry brushing on that rock. The rock is not actually dry brushed, but it looks that way. So in places where the rock is more, you know, kind of broken, there are, there are those natural spots like, um, well, like this little area in here is kind of that natural stone and around the muzzle, there's some of that. So just, Having that for reference is also handy. And also this, this splotchy lichen, whatever it is, good to have on hand. I don't, I may actually do some of this super light green stuff. Because like I said, the armor does have kind of a greenish cast to it. So if I do, it's going to be very sparse. All right, so the next step is to start playing with, with a variety of colors. So I'm just gonna lay down a couple patches of these variants. And then I'm going to do a big thing of black here. big thing of white here and then I will just experiment with um, pulling those colors in a variety of shades so we'll have some dark blackish green right here and I'll use a different brush to get some really be using my crappy brushes for this. Some light green over here. I was having a lot of good luck dipping it in the denatured alcohol. Um, but not so much with this one for some reason. Not sure why. Wow, actually this green, this uh, this white mixed with the, what is this, green umber, 
I feel like it's a pretty good uh, approximation of this kind of lichen if I want to splotch that around in certain areas. Works better as that than it does as a um, as a stone tinter, I think. See if you mix uh, the white and the green in a non-uniform way, so there's still splotches of the white, then you can get this little this kind of dimensional effect and variegation without having to go in and do little hand, you know, pinpointing here and there. I'm going to be doing all of these colors on a variety, you know, I want to make sure I see what does this yellow look like when it's on super dark and what's it look like when it's on a super light area. And I'm going to leave a variety of saturations on here as well. So I'm going to leave that super bright yellow like that and then other areas more subtle. Uh, so that after I put the, the next couple coats on, I'll have a good idea of um, how subtle I want to begin. I want it to be at this stage. Because after the little bit of dry brushing and the wash, a lot of this uh, contrast that you see is going to be taken away. Okay, so while those colors are drying, I'm going to go ahead and start painting on Wander. Now, I don't know if it's coincidence or if I'm just so tuned in to uh, the color scheme here, but it turns out these this is the exact color palette of Wander. It's got the, the tan for the clothing, the greenish for the pants, the bluish for the little headband, and sandals and arm thingies and then the brown for the other leather bits and hair no yellow but yeah pretty crazy huh so anyway i'm gonna start laying down colors
So these little dangly bits, I don't remember if I mentioned this or not. I'm interpreting these as braid, like braided tufts of fur, like trophies. Um, and yeah, I guess I just wanted to say that that explains why I'm about to paint them white-ish. Basically the Colossus fur. I thought about actually braiding them with thread, but the amount, I think that would just take forever. Also, another quick note, don't um, ever make, well, don't ever say ever when it comes to art. In general, when you're doing miniatures, you don't want anything to be pure white. It just looks fake. So, mix in a little bit of this taupe into the white here. In real life, stuff gets dirty and dusty, especially when you're climbing up giant hairy monsters. So, I would not want anything super bright white on him. I mean, you see how white that looks just as it is, and look at how white it is compared to the actual white of this plastic, right? It's it's really creamy, but on the context of this dirty character, it totally stands out very bright. One thing you want to avoid if you want your brushes to last longer is to keep uh, paint from getting up in the, what is that called, the ferro or something like that, up, up where it touches the metal there. Because once paint gets in there, it dries and spreads the bristles apart. I'm not doing such a great job at accomplishing that. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a wash over the cloth to pick up some of the details of the um, stitching. So I'm just watering down this brown really, really thin. To where if you rub it over the plastic, you can see it's not showing up very well, which is what we want. So that way, when you run it over the seams, it's just going to soak into the cracks, leaving the, uh, the three-dimensional elements to pop out better. And it'll probably work just fine on the pants as well. I don't have really good reference printed out right now for the exact color of the scabbard and sword. So I'm gonna go do some research and figure that out real quick. Uh, but first, I had an idea after sleeping on it. You know, these colors are super bright. On the, on the tiles I did on the platform, I 
mixed a little like a drop of color with gray to get kind of a, a tinted gray instead of just putting the bright colors right onto the gray over the gray so even when i watered it down it's still pretty extreme ish so i have a thought of i'm going to use this guy since i don't like him anyway and i'm going to put some bright colors down on it and then i'm going to do the same thing i did to this guy over those colors and see what that gets me might like it better we'll see All right, so his sword and scabbard are mostly this blah color. Kind of just muddy gray brown. I'm kind of getting hints of maybe like bronze or brass on the, uh, the sword scabbard bits. Um, Maybe that's a little bit on that part. Um, yeah, so in general, I think I'm just going to go really subdued. I've got, I'm going to use these uh, True Metal paints. These are really cool. Um, I did a video on, on metallic paints. You can check that out. I'll try to put a link in the description. Um, and these are perfect for this particular kind of application where it's just little details on a little a little guy it'll work great but this stuff a little bit goes a long way this is a wax based paint so its properties are a little bit different you need to use you can't thin it with water you need to use um I think denatured alcohol or do I use mm, this other stuff we've got. Oh, no, I think it's uh, mineral spirits. This is the stuff you thin it with. Alright, so the scabbard. I think I'll just leave it black. I'll do a little dry brush. In fact, let me do that now. Basically, I'm just trying to get a, <clears throat> a highlight that's still very muddy. And by highlight, doesn't have to be bright, just has to be brighter than black. So. On to the old bronze. So I'm taking a little bit of the mineral spirits and dipping my brush into the mineral spirits. And then just pulling some of the paint out until I've got a, a good flow. Okay, I'm gonna try something stupid because I feel like it. This is... I, the, the reason that I want to try this is because the Colossus has real fur and Wander has sculpted hair. And the sculpted hair isn't as convincing when it's right next to real fur. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could actually get some bits of hair onto his head in a way that's not completely ridiculous and so I'm gonna try it and it's probably not gonna work and then I'll scrape it off and repaint the hair and it shouldn't be a big deal so what I'm trying is this uh, Tibetan uh, what is it um, I can't remember what this is called mohair no maybe is this does this say no, it calls it skin. It's definitely not skin. This is definitely hair of some sort. I want to say it comes from like a yak or a llama type beast. I don't remember now. Anyway, there's the website. You could go look it up for yourself. Uh, the reason that I'm trying this stuff is because it is super, super fine. So 
doll makers who make tiny little dolls um, with hair, this is the stuff because it scales down really nicely. So I am going to just try to snip off a bit and see how I can glue it without making it look like a bad toupee or, you know, like a Donald Trump haircut or something. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I need to straighten it. See, his actual hair is, is a little bit wavy, and so I want to have some of that. I'm wondering if it's one of those things where I'll have to like glue it down in rows and just kind of progressively go up higher and higher and kind of cut it with tiny scissors as I go. Let's give that a try. Why not? Oh, I know why. Because I have three days left to finish this. That's why I should not be doing this. So the first thing I'm going to try to use is uh, Mod Podge because um, I think that's what I'm going to be using for his little cape which I just printed out on paper and uh, maybe it'll work for the hair, we'll see. Uh, I mean, so the thing that I know I have to avoid is big globs. So I'm just going to use the tip of my X-Acto knife. Try to put on a really thin layer. That is probably too thick. We'll see. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of press it on willy nilly. Don't know how I can get much more control. I think. If I press it on the glue like so, and then kind of hold it down with my finger and pull in one direction, I can at least get it all going in the in the same general direction, and he's not going to have a giant afro or something. Hmm, just comes right off. So, hmm. I'm gonna try it a little bit thicker. And I'm going to try to get one solid line. So I think the way to do that is to bunch it up, cut it. And press it into place. Are you impressed? I am not impressed yet. But we'll see. Give that a minute. I'm going to try just for the heck of it to straighten some of the hair and see if that seems more promising. Just using a hair straightener. Wouldn't it be funny if he had crazy hair like that? Okay, I'm going to let that dry. And I'm going to go back to the stone tests for a bit. No, actually, I'm going to do a test with this real quick. I want to see what kind of a finish I end up with if I'm just crumpling paper up, coating it in Mod Podge and see if that makes it kind of stiff and permanent. And hopefully it won't be all weird and shiny. This is matte, matte, matte. So I think that means it should be a nice matte 
finish and not semi-glossy or anything. Okay, so if we coat it, and then do all the crumpling. Oh yeah, crumpling needs to happen up here at the shoulders. And it's very hard to do when it's all slick and coated with glue. So I might try another method of folding it the way I want it and then brushing the glue on. We'll see. I mean, ideally it kind of bunches up in a way that cloth actually would. I'm going to have it blowing off to the side dramatically. So let's just leave it like this and see what we end up with. Now back to this rocky thing. Okay, I'm going to do that paint thing that I did before, which is where I basically just put gray over it and then spattered uh, white over it. And because his armor is kind of greenish, I'm going to add just a hint of green. Boy, I can barely see that green at all. But that's fine. I do want it to be super subtle. So this method has the unfortunate side effect of leaving the colors in the in the cracks. Which will be mostly wiped out once a uh, once the wash goes into those cracks. I wonder if I watered this down more. What kind of effect I'll get then. So if it's watery enough, then the gray will run into the cr into the cracks and leave the colors on the higher spots, which I think is more what I'm aiming for. I think. Definitely seeing more color come through, but. <laughs> Oh man, so, I mean, where I laid the color on thick, I mean, that's just ridiculous. It should not be like primary yellow like that. But some of these more subtle ones probably work all right. So I think I'm gonna, this worked really well to have it dark like that and then the white spatter although I wonder hmm, now that I think about it let's see what happens when we do lighter with dark spatter don't think that's quite as cool an effect as the dark with light spatter but let's try both so we Got some dark, let's try some light. Hmm. I wonder if um, doing the kind of medium with light on it gets it more towards that fake stone look, you know, that spray paint stone. If it's just a matter of the, the light difference, like, why does this look so much better to me? Is it because it's so dark and the whites are so bright? Or is it because they're, it's not really uniform? There are lots of areas where there's very little or no spatter. I'm going to try doing part of this just darker. And then do the light spatter. Hmm. I think it's just better 
dark with the with the light my concern then is that the wash is going to make it like super dark and there are definitely light areas on the armor so i don't and on top of that i'm going to be going in and punching up some of the shadows although i maybe i don't have to if uh, if it's so dark to begin with but I mean, and then dry brushing, if I do a dry brush at some point, that's also going to change the dynamic. Let's see what happens with a dry brush on this guy. Well, it looks like dry brushing doesn't completely wipe out what's nice about those splotches. And it definitely does help to um, bring out the detail and lighten the whole thing up a bit. Man, I almost think I might not even need a wash if I go this direction. Because the cracks are so dark from the dark base coat. Huh. I'm definitely, uh, in case you're wondering, I am not liking anything that's happening with these colors and I'm seriously considering just nixing the whole color idea and just keeping it keeping it like that one temple and I'm gonna look at it to remind myself yeah so this temple clearly all the rocks were mined from one area and it was a pretty consistent homogeneous area there's no pinks or greens or purples or blues it's all just this very uh, greeny yellow white and so there's there's darker and there's lighter and then there's little bits of lichen and stuff and that's I think that's plenty that's fine yeah I think I was just basically overthinking it with the colors just trying to throw everything at it and I don't need to throw everything at it I've already thrown you know, many hundreds of hours into the sculpting. I don't need to, you know, gussy that up more with paint on top of it. That's what I'm thinking right now. Just as a quick little curiosity test, what happens if I add little bits of color while it's still wet? That's definitely closer to something I can live with. Still not convinced it's necessary. But it's really easy to modulate while it's still very wet. That's, that's pretty cool. The nice thing about that is then I can go in and do my my lichen spatter and it goes over the color. Well, I think this might be a really good solution. I think I may have just stumbled across my final base coat method. Yeah, I, I really like what's going on there. And here, you know, that whole block is just slightly different. Not enough to really stand out and be crazy like these are. But enough to just give you that feel. The feel that I want. So let me do more of that over here. And see if I could reproduce it real quick. Oh, the paint is just on there so thick that it's covering up all the detail. See if paper towel in it creates a happy accident. Hmm. 
Okay, I think this is a direction I'm definitely thinking I can be successful with. So I'm going to redo a couple of these with this method. Just a triple check. Hmm. I'm actually, since I'm using um, all this denatured alcohol, I can go in and I can hit my low lights just with a paintbrush. I may not have to use an airbrush because when it's all wet with the denatured alcohol, it um, kind of blends everything together really nicely. You don't have to worry about paint strokes. which is the main reason to use an airbrush, is you don't get paint strokes. Of course, if you do it wrong, then you get airbrush strokes and it looks even worse, but that's a different story. Also, when you keep dipping the brush in the alcohol and then going back to the piece, every time you dab it, you're putting more alcohol on the surface which is driving the paint and the pigment down into the cracks so it's I'm basically I'm getting a wash at the same time that I'm getting the base coat which could be a real time saver this reminds me this cast has all these little air bubbles and pockets in it which reminds me, I wanted to go in and ding up a lot of the bricks with that kind of stuff to give that feel that some of the rock just doesn't have the same hardness and chemical composition as others. I think that's a really compelling look. And it's relatively fast to do. So the thing that's nice about mixing the colors in with the gray on the surface is that everything is becoming unified and homogenized as I paint it. I don't have to worry about having a separate palette where I've got the same ratios of paint mixed and ready to go. I can just use it straight out of the bottle and it's mixing wet on the piece. And if I put it on and it seems too bright, then it's just a matter of mushing it around more and boom, it's no longer too bright. Like I'm not liking how much that yellow stands out. So just going in and smearing it around some more. Okay. I think that's good testing for now. Let's go back to do another layer of hair. See if that shows any promise. Looks like some strands are actually glued on now. Also looks like where the glue is there's significant dark patch there which is not gonna work unless I could maybe dry brush the hair or something I don't know still think But even, you know, if you look at the profile there, or, well, not profile, whatever, you know, you can, a little, those little flyaway hairs are definitely, like, take it to the next level of realism. So, let's see what happens. Alright, just pressing that down and 
see what happens when that dries. All right, back to paint tests. These are still too wet to do a dry brush on. I'm gonna put them down by my heater so they'll dry faster. So it looks like the Mod Podge definitely stiffened this up a bit. I'm gonna give it some more time to dry, but it is also a little bit glossy. I'm hoping that when I hit it with a, uh, the um, matte finish clear coat spray, that will go away. Okay, what's next? Uh, let's polish some metal. Actually, let's clean some brushes. So this uh, metal stuff is supposed to be, you can buff it to make it shinier. I don't want the, um, the bronze parts to get shinier because they're not really shiny in the game, but the sword blade is. So, and they say you can use your finger, you can use a Q-tip, you can use a toothpick. So I'll just try it with these gloves and see if that makes it any shinier. Makes a fun squeaky sound. I don't know, does that look shinier to you? Doesn't really look shinier to me. I might hit this with my chrome spray paint. Let's try an ungloved hand. I do feel like that is making it smoother, but not shinier. But making it smoother could be the first step to making it shinier. Okay, I'm going to do another coat of silver on there. 